age-old question, lithium iron. So in recent years, we've seen a lot of the adaption of lithium into our tray canopy setups, the caravan, the entire RV industry and marine industry. And we get a load of questions as to what it all means. So we'll start from the start. Lithium mines, obviously a chemical composition, Boom. effectively power storage. And you probably heard for the last hundred odd years, we've used typically lead acid. So lead acid's very heavy. That's one of the major considerations moving to lithium. To get a similar output in lead acid to lithium is significantly different. We've got 150 amp hours in this battery here to something of equivalent value. You're probably stepping into the 40 to 50 kilo mark in lead acid. Whereas this weighs no more than 17 kilos as it sits with a 40 amp charger inside of it. So we can use in a good quality lithium like these up to 95% of this storage capacity. And what we rate as 150 amp hours is 150 amp hours usable. So what we rate is exactly what you're gonna get, what the battery's storage capacity limits and where it's dry zone and where it hits its dead zone is five ish percent more than that so we're using almost the entire capacity of the cell lead acid you're just looking at on the other side up to 40 percent um, left so only using 60 percent of the battery and that's on a good one but there are a couple of things we need to consider and there are a couple of things you need to consider for what lithium setup you want to go for so if we put lead acid to the side completely and we move straight to lithium and just talk about lithium iron it's safety firstly we'll talk about lithium ion versus lithium ion phosphate. So lithium ion, something you see in a Tesla. Um, obviously when those, for lack of better terms, explode or become volatile and excited, they almost create their own oxygen. They're inextinguishable and you can't put them out. Lithium ion phosphate, on the other hand, which is what our batteries and most of the industry uses, is actually not volatile. A lot of people think they're Lithium mine's gonna explode or spontaneously combust. It's simply not. We can drive a drill through this and all it's gonna do is smolder. It's a very safe and very stable technology. It's why we use it. It's why industry's adopted it as well. So we're gonna move on to cost between what lithium costs within the lithium range. Uh, you, I've seen batteries as cheap as two, three hundred dollars, right up to a couple of thousand. I think the difference between a lot of these comes down to cell quality it also comes down to BMS quality as well, how that management happens. I, I believe when you're out bush, or if you're in an emergency situation, uh, there is no compromise in power quality. And I personally wouldn't want to put my family or any situation into compromise from having a poor quality battery that would effectively fail uh, when you need it most. So you've got to put trust in the company you're buying anything from, especially lithium. Moving on to the technology itself, Again, we've touched on lithium ion phosphate being a much better technology, much safer, much less volatile. And if we move on further again, we have componentry inside, we have management systems inside. That's where a lot of your technology comes from. And that also is a major contributing factor to the reliability and obviously safety of the battery. Another consideration is what you're using it for. If you're gonna be running inverters, you have to look at the BMS's output, its ability to discharge power. The cells themselves can discharge a lot of power quite quickly. If you've got a BMS that isn't suited to do that, there's no way in Hades that that's gonna happen. So if you do plan on using any inverters, whether they be a thousand, two or 3000 watt, you have to consider what the current that's gonna be drawing at its max usage. So something around your 2000 watt, you're gonna be drawing around 160 to 200 amps at any one time. So if your BMS is only rated to 100 amps, discharge that battery is simply not going to work irrespective of its capacity or irrespective of how much it could dis discharge on a cellular level we've also got charge ratings so some of these inverters and inverter chargers do have a short power charging option which simply means you can charge them from a 240 socket at a caravan park or at home or even from a generator and what that means is you're going to be pumping on this particular 2000 va 80 amps into a battery some BMSs don't allow that. They'll only charge at 60 or 70 amps. So you have to match battery to what you're using it for in terms of discharge, but also charge as well. Most people do want to run an inverter. That's one of the major benefits of lithium. It's ability to discharge a lot of power quickly. Make sure you keep in mind your BMS must be matched both on charge and discharge to what you actually want to be using it for. Stick to the trusted sources. 
stick to people who know what they're talking about. Use the calculators online to start mapping out your system in terms of discharge, in terms of what you want to charge with and how you're going to be using the system and, and work into it as well. Most people end up buying products afterwards that they don't count for initially. So it's, it's a little bit of design, there's a little bit of consideration there, but the main point is bike quality gear that you can use for a long time. Lithium does last a long time and you want to future-proof that. I want to talk about lithium batteries and more particularly the Exco lithium battery range. Our, our battery range does extend quite far, right up to a 470 amp hour, down to a 105. More importantly, these two batteries right here are what we spec typically into canopies and trays. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I want to talk about the 150 amp hour. In particular, this is one of our most popular batteries. Huge discharge capacity of 240 amps. We've also got a 150 amp storage rating and we've also got 40 amp DC DC charge that's integrated into the unit. So in terms of storage capacity, 150 amp hours is more than enough for the average punter. To be able to run inverters, large house household appliances is a massive advantage and having 40 amps of DC DC charging integrated into the battery is very very important as well. So you've got best of both worlds with this style of battery. Moving on to the 110 amp hour, what the 110 is best suited for is usually lower inverter wattages. So under a thousand watts is typically what we see with those. Most people that use the 110s don't want to use an inverter, they've got no need for it. Um, and that usually ends up in tray and canopy setups where it's not the primary use of a caravan they're towing or something else. So it lends itself fantastically to 12 volt use. So lighting, fridges, small pie ovens, bits and pieces, something where um, inverters just aren't something they need. So the 110 also lends itself to a 20 amp charger integrated as well. So both batteries have chargers in them. It's a level of autonomy where you wanted to add to the range where it was line less thing to wire in. So the 110 is a little bit slimmer at only 50 mil. So it's a great alternative behind seats and vehicles. Also integrates beautifully into the canopy wall of our canopies. We do have a 50 mil recess that the frame then creates for us. Um, and we wasted no time in developing something that fits that really well. So all battery and different configurations are uh, integrated into our canopy through our mounting system. We do a twin 150 giving 300 amp hours, a single 150 and a single 110. The reason we don't, people do ask, do a dual 110 is the 150 usually takes that place. So through a lot of design and research, we've developed three mounting systems which integrate these seamlessly into our canopy walls. They get them off the floor. They utilize what we would call dead space. They keep them out of harm's way and cool up in that canopy wall on the front there as well. Another consideration is cell type so we use a tier one cell it is very very expensive to use a tier one cell they are first rate they are picked and bin properly having a tier one cell we can get 5,000 cycles at 80 percent which is phenomenal we do take manufacturing quite seriously for lithium everything we do under the terraloom brand is made in brisbane and various different facilities both bms and dc dc chargers are actually made in brisbane also including the pcb or the printed circuit board and all the components that are assembled there as well. Lithium was something we partnered with a company in Brisbane with um, who have done this for over 10 years and not just in a recreational space but more in an emergency space and a military scene space as well. So we've got um, levels of quality in here that people's lives effectively rely on. So there was no hesitation in choosing this manufacturer to build our gear spec it's the way we wanted. So all of our lithium carries a five-year warranty. All of them are serviceable should a cell be out of balance, an issue with the casing, something breaks, they are fully serviceable. A lot of people ask how we charge these, but an integrated charger, how it all works? Great question. Direct from the vehicle, we've got 12 volt positive negative. There's two ways to activate the charger. One's via ignition, it's our most absolute source. Very, very reliable. Should there be no ignition source, we use a VSR or a voltage sensitive relay, which was, it's been used for decades prior. In terms of discharge, we have a 50 amp Anderson plug out on both of these. And the 150, we've got two studs as well. So for higher amperage stuff like inverters, um, compressors and so on, we do have studs that we can use up to a couple of hundred amps in. So another little consideration with the integrated chargers in these is we need to measure the uh, charging rate or the amperage that goes to the charger via a shunt. And there's a couple of questions around that. I'll just straighten it out really quickly. Negative or the, the black cable that you typically run to your charger. 
needs to actually go through the shunt. We can't use a, a what we call a lazy earth or something that's passive. The current, the current physically needs to transfer and travel through that shunt into the charger. That measures the draw from the battery that the charger is requiring and subsequently gives us our net discharge or charge rating the shunt needs. I want to introduce the brand new hub that Terralume have created with a company called HMWS. So it's a very, very unique solution to what we call a total power management interface. And it is exactly that, it is an interface. And I'll run through it quickly from top to bottom. There is so much that goes into this. Uh, I think what we wanted to create was something that was totally unique in its design, but also its function, uh, and that handled everything. We wanted to really comprehensively cover power management uh, in terms of load monitoring, load protection, um, in terms of usability for, for daily items. I mean, everyone's using some sort of device, tablet, whether it be um, iPhone or Am uh, Android. And we wanted to really utilize people's lifestyles these days and what they actually use their gear for instead of just making something that was slapped together. This couple of design briefs had to be compact, uh, had to be very comprehensive, had to cover everything and it needed to do everything it did really well. We'll move on to what first is the screen or what we call the monitor, and that is a Victron Touch 50. Touch 50 is effectively our display and an, our resource for actually tuning everything as well. Moving further down is the Switchmaster 8, which is a product we actually sell every day of the week. Very, very unique product, very, very reliable too. The, the Switchmaster 8 is an eight channel. It's effectively a PDM or a power distribution module. We use a digital relay system rather than an analog relay system that almost everyone else, is everyone else uses. There's a couple of reasons for that. The load control is a lot more complex. We use one big shunt about this big rather than a bank of relays and fuses. We don't need to run fuses and relays, so it handles that as well. And each channel is 15 amps. So we've got eight channels here. Each can control 15 amps, handles all of our loads. So there's no need for fuses and relays in line, wiring into the unit and um, it's quite compact, very, very, very small. And we move into USB charging, six socket outlet. This model 65 watts usually charges all of our larger tablets and bits and pieces. Down here, two six sockets, which is general purpose outlet. In the middle, isolator. This isolates everything down from here. It leaves our Sherbo unit and our um, Touch 50 still running, so it retains our settings. We don't isolate that. Uh, and there is very, very minimal parasitic drain from that. So leaving that on isn't an issue. And here's a GPO or a general power outlet, giving us two power outlets. Below, we've got two outlets, general purpose. So that's used for charge and discharge. So should you need to charge from the shore, we've got 50 amp Anderson in. We've also got a regulated power in uh, from solar as well. So that's the hub interface from the start. That's it. Wow, that was loud. As we move to the back, we've got serialized um, part number here. So this unit goes into production. Again, all built in Australia. We've got an 80 amp circuit breaker, which effectively handles the entire hub's 12 volt side. RCD, not required um, in, in, a, in a technical sense, but we believe that why not should be in there. So that's for the 240 side of things. IEC plug connects directly to an inverter. Below that, we have a GLAN opening for Cat5, Cat6 cables for the Sherbo. Should we be running other Victron products? Uh, we have the secondary switch output, as I mentioned earlier. The front panel, we've also got a second panel, should you want that switches in through here. This is the main output. So eight channels, pos and neg go directly into here via this plug. All negative loads seem to go through here. So if we've got inverters running, battery chargers, solar, anything that runs current to a battery needs to go through this unit. To do that, we have a negative, a twin negative ando down here. We've also got two studs for higher amp products as well. This Anderson here that's colored gray is our input for the unit. It livens up the unit in its entirety, all the charges, the switch master, everything. This is typically what you will receive as part of a cable harness. It plugs directly into the main feed. There's three meters of cable on this for positive and negative. So we, we want to minimize solder joints and connections. So we decided to make a longer harness so you can get your longest cable run sorted without having to solder in or connect again to get to your accessory. And of course we have another patch lead that goes into the smaller socket that carries our second switch panel. The idea of our hub here 
is it sits on the front wall of a canopy, can go on the back of a wagon, can be orientated any way in which it works for you. Typically the front wall of the canopy would be here and slight tapered edge would allow you to natively see it on a tapered edge in the front canopy wall. We wanted to bring something out that was, was built from a specification rather than a price and, um, and we want to stand by this. We wanted to be proud of this for years to come. We wanted to work for people uh, exactly how we intended it forever. The feedback from customers is why is no one else doing this? Don't really know the answer to that, but we do things our way and that's why we want to roll. And this is just another extension of that.